Welcome to episode 27 of Chew on This, a Nerds United podcast. I'm BJ. Vic. So, uh, we have both seen uh, X-Men Apocalypse. Yeah. And, and uh, man, it's kind of a departure for me from uh, Brian Singer's earliest work. Like, it felt um, more Superman Returns than it did uh, X-Men 2. <laughs> you think so? Um, you think it's on that I level? I don't know. I... I don't think it's on the level of Superman Returns. I think it's right above that. But for whatever reason, man, like when I walked out of there, I was like, you know what? I hate to say this. And maybe I'm one of the only people that, but I felt like X-Men, the, the last stand was a tad better. And I, I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that movie because Brett Ratner, I, I think really derailed the franchise, but I walked out of there going like, it just wasn't fun. It, it was just very like, um, I don't know. There was, there was, I was just anxious and kind of bored at times. And, um, I don't know, like my, my initial reaction, I just walked out there going like, I, I mean, it's better, better than a lot of movies out there, but still it's, I mean, I think it's just becoming oversaturated. I, I think we needed more time in between, you know, these superhero movies, you know, I, I love that they're bringing them out, but having them so close together, Batman and, and Captain America, which Captain America is far superior over both these movies combined, um, and 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 X Men. So I, I don't know. What was your reaction when you when you uh, finished m- the movie? Um, you know, I, I knew it wasn't tracking well, so um, I just I'll just give a quick recap before we go over all the boring stuff. Um, I you know I, I don't think I I hated it as much as people are hating on it. Um, mm-hmm. It's not on the same level as X Men Two. It's not on the same level as uh, Days of Futures Past, and it's not on the same level as even the first X Men. That being said, it's definitely better than The Last Stand. Um, it's definitely better than any other X Men movie. Uh, um, well, the only other X Men movie was uh, the um, Wolverine, uh, the X Men Origins one. Um, I mm-hmm. think it might be on the same level as. The Wolverine, but I think the Wolverine might be a tad bit better. Okay. Um, you know, I, I didn't. I, I read some minor non-spoiler reviews before going to see this movie, and they said that the action was, you know, not not great because the story wasn't too great. I'm just kind of torn about it because, I mean, we've seen a lot of X Men movies, right? And in the X Men universe, Apocalypse is they're kind of Thanos contained, you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Thanos is, you know, the entire world. And I I believe the X-Men have fought Thanos before. Um, Definitely Deadpool has fought Thanos before. Um, um, And, you know, on the other side of the DC, you know, dark side is, is that, that overarching godlike character and apocalypse is like almost like an earthly God to me. Where he's not like um, a universal god. Like if right. if, you, if you put right. if you put Apocalypse up against Thanos, Thanos would kill him every single time. <laughs> yeah. So in that sense, it it um, it didn't have the same kind of effect as when Thanos was announced. But at the same time, I was expecting a lot more from the com- because of the comic books that I've read and because of because of the X Men animated series. Apocalypse was such a badass in that. Yeah. And. I felt like this one had the same flaw, and I'm jumping around a lot. Oh, and by the way, spoilers. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I felt like I felt like in this movie they jumped um, the gun with the Phoenix saga again. Yeah, because like that's basically how Apocalypse is defeated, and I'm wondering like, okay, well, we you kind of just reintroduced Jean Grey. You don't even train her, and now all of a sudden she's tapped into the Phoenix Force, and right. it's almost it's almost like they did the same thing in X Men Two. When, yeah, you introduced her in X Men One, and all of a sudden she has issues with her power, and she still hasn't learned to fully control her her ability in the, in X Men Two, and mm-hmm. in this one it's the same thing. But this one's way early, earlier, and you'd think Brian Singer would have realized his mistake from the first one or I'm sorry, the second movie where don't rush to get to the Phoenix saga because right. You know, um, and I think we talked about this before that it's always about what's, what's tiresome about the X-Men movies to me is it's always, you know, it's almost like this, like the, cause the X-Men were basically created for like racial undertones. Right. You know, 
mm-hmm. uh, and the ignorance of, of, of people out there. But at this point in time, it's almost the same story every single time. Every you know, time. Yeah. I mean, Apocalypse has just taken over Magneto's role in this movie. Um, that being said, my favorite scene in this movie is has Magneto in it. Um, so, I mean, we could talk about that later. Um, but let, let's let's go over the, the boring stuff for now. Um, yeah. You didn't even have it in your top ten. So it was outside no, your top ten. No, it was right was, outside. Yeah. Right. And this was even before we saw any footage. So that was kind of interesting to me that with Brian Singer's history of, of really good to great X-Men movies, you didn't even have it in your top 10. No, because I, I felt because there were other movies that I was way more interested in. Like, it, like to me, it was almost like it's proven, you know, I, I like the X-Men movies, even the, the crappiest ones. I still enjoy them for what they are. And so I just didn't, I, I don't know, like it didn't interest me even hearing about what it was about. I was like, ah. Eh. You know, Days of Futures Past, when I heard that title, I freaked out. That, to me, was like one of the best storylines. And even before I saw any footage, I was excited about that movie. But Apocalypse, I, I just wasn't. So that's why it was right on the outside for me. Well, but look, you had it at... Uh, I, had t- I, had it in my, I had it number six, I believe. Yeah, number six. <laughs> yeah. And, the, and the reason the reason I had it that high is because, because of Brian Singer's, you know, uh, mm-hmm. history and and street cred with his X-Men movies. I mean, Days of Futures Past is probably the best X-Men movie in the franchise. Some can argue X-Men 2 is. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, so yeah, I had it in my in my, in my my top 10, number six. You didn't even have it. Um, it's, it's not tracking that great. Um, and like we've talked it, about before, movie-wise, like if, if you're going to be a comic book, comic book movie, and because now there's so much oversaturation, if you're not certified fresh from Rotten Tomato, a lot of people aren't going to go see your movie. Right. So, What's it like, sitting at? Right. Do you know what uh, it's sitting at right now? Well, right now it's got forty eight percent. So right it now. went back up. So it went up. Yeah, it went. It was. It was, got, it was as low as like twenty nine yesterday. But yeah, it's got a hundred. It as of as of this recording, it has a as a hundred eleven fresh and one hundred twenty rotten. So it's right on the brink of you know fifty fifty, which is kind of surprising considering. Um. You know, uh, he has never had an X Men movie uh, be below sixty or seventy percent. I think. Yeah, below Not certified even. fresh. I but see, I, when I walked out of the movie, I, I was like, yeah, this is like Man of Steel. This is like fifty five percent for me. I was like, when I when I walked out, and so when I saw it as kept dropping as low as twenty nine, I was like, nah, that's that just feels like people jumping on the bandwagon. But it looks like it's evening out. It looks like pe- more and more people are seeing it now and saying you know, it's not that, it's, that it's bad. It's not, and and here's the crazy part about this whole thing, and this is probably surprising for you. I don't know if you looked this up, but like I just said, Apocalypse is at forty eight percent. The Last Stand is at fifty eight percent. Fifty eight. Yes, the Brett Ratner piece of shit Last Stand is at fifty eight percent. Oh, Last Stand. La- yeah, I thought you said Days of Future's Past. What is no, that? No, 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 no. X Men Last oh. Stand is at fifty eight percent. Yeah, I, I'm not. But see, I'm not. I'm not that surprised because that's still the original X Men with Wolverine and all the all the the older people in it, and so that's that's just proven track record. People know who those people are. That actually, I think, scored really. A big weekend when it came out, probably the biggest out of the out of the first three, and uh, I, I, you know, I I didn't enjoy that one as much as the first two, but still, it was I was like I liked the characters, I liked some of the things that happened. We finally got to see kind of Wolverine go to a little bit in Berserker mode. Um, the, some of it obviously was a little cheesy, but I, there's pieces of that movie that I that I do like. This movie. I can really only count maybe twice where I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. Like I was not jumping out of my seat. I wasn't excited. I mean, this is not civil war or even Batman V Superman where I jumped out of my seat a couple times too. There, there was nothing that just excited me in this movie. It was just a, a ho-hum X-Men movie. That's all it was. It wasn't anything that, that I, I get on the phone with you and go like, dude, did you see that? Oh my God. You know, nothing, nothing was like that. Yeah, I, I, maybe you know, maybe 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 I can agree with you to agree be, to a degree because um, there was no 
like jump out of my seat. Holy shit, I can't believe I just saw that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, But I will say the acting and and the story moves a lot smoother than Batman v Superman. Um, I mean, Henry Henry Cavill probably would not even have made this cast the way that he acts in Batman v Superman. I'll give you that. The cast was great, but I will say this. The beginning... The first half, the first 20 minutes or so plays like Batman v Superman's first 20 minutes. There's so many jump cuts. Like it just, they focus on one thing for like 20 seconds and then they just flash over to something else really quickly. I think because they're, they're trying to, you know, put together the the four horsemen or whatever. I, I understand that, but they just flipped around so much. You know, I wanted to stick around with some of those characters a little bit more. Um, but, uh, you know. I, I don't know. The, the cast was good, though. Like, I thought Jean Grey, I thought, uh, what is that actress's name? She's on Game of Thrones, plays yeah. Sansa. I, I thought she was great. Um, uh, Storm, I thought was really cool. Um, I don't know. Who else was in that thing? Uh, Scott Summers, uh, the Cyclops, who's actually supposed to be the leader, you know, of the X-Men. Um, what did you think of Olivia then, Munn? Um, wasted. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely wasted. Um, that was probably the biggest disappointment for me was uh, Psylocke. And I and, and she looks great. She looks like Psylocke. They did. I mean, a fantastic job. She jumps right out of the comic book pages onto that movie. But she ends up doing one cool move, slices a car in half, which we've seen a thousand trailer. times yeah. in the commercials. Yeah. And uh, she says two lines in the whole movie. So I don't I don't understand why they have her in there. Other than she is going to come back, obviously, because of the, in the end, you see her kind of like slip or slip away. My favorite part in the my favorite person or part in this whole movie is uh, is uh, Magneto. Um, and he kind of gets lost in the latter in the latter half of the movie. But my favorite scene in the entire movie was when he finally gives himself up to the cops Oh my gosh! And, and you the, know, you know it's coming, man. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I did, wasn't expecting the arrow to go through both of them. Um, yeah, but that yeah. scene right there is is something that like Zack Snyder could never pull off. Right. Like he came close to that scene in the in the man in the in Batman v Superman when he's standing in the courtroom. Yeah, but that that's what I wanted for that scene in Batman v Superman was that one Magneto scene where he's yelling up at nobody. Basically he's probably yelling up at, he thinks he's yelling up at God, but he's really yelling up at apocalypse and doesn't realize it. But you know, he's yelling up, is this who you want me to be? And you know, because he's such a fucking good actor, that scene was gut wrenching to me. It was um, really hard. And, and it, and it fueled the motive. Like you understood his motivation to like say F it. I'm just going to go and, I mean, God, he took the necklace and like sliced, just killed all those soldiers in one, you know, swoop. Right. You never had to go back to him and real and really have his conflict because right then and there, you knew he was going to join Apocalypse, and that's right. and that's what good storytelling is. You know, you don't have to keep fucking like, you know, keep going back to it. Like, uh, I fuck, I, we always go back to this movie, Batman v Superman. You know, you don't mm-hmm. have to keep going. You don't have to see Superman fucking like going back and forth the whole fucking time. Because if you if you showed that courtroom scene and did the same thing that Brian Singer did with Magneto, you could understand right then and there in one scene and complete his story of of going back and forth of why he doesn't know whether or not he wants to help humanity. You know, right. instead you have to fucking keep showing it over and over again, and he's on the balcony telling Lois like I don't want to do this anymore, like fucking grow a pair, Superman. But with right. Magneto, with Magneto. Man, that's so that that was that was probably the highlight of the movie for me right there. I think um, I wasn't, I, you know, the the Quicksilver scene that they were talking about that was gonna like top the first time in in uh, Days of Future's Past. I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't think that. I mean, it was still good. Um, I think they took like two months to shoot that one scene. Um, it was still oh, good, yeah. but it didn't. It just kind of came out of nowhere, you know. It was kind of out of place. You know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of season two of Daredevil when he they did the whole fighting going down the building scene. They were trying to top the hallway scene from the right. season one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was exactly like that. Like I'm watching it going like, oh, this is cool. 
But I didn't have that goosebump feeling from the first movie where I was like, holy shit, you got to be kidding me. Right. You know, it was just so awesome. But this one, they just kind of like threw it in. Yeah, they almost like kind of went back to the well because they did such a good job in the first movie, but like they failed miserably in trying to top it instead of doing something, you know, a little bit different because he's kind of wasted in the final battle, too. Oh, yeah, he gets his leg broken. Yeah, I mean, what he does to Apocalypse, that was probably the highlight of the entire fight because everything after that is just like giant special effects of, you know, explosions of Apocalypse, you know, defending all of everybody's powers like Scott Summers and all the all the metal that Magneto's throwing at him. There's nothing really great. Um, but when he starts punching Apocalypse and all that shit, that was pretty funny and pretty cool at the same time that you've never seen before. Yeah. You know, so I think th- in that sense, like, that they understand how to use Quicksilver in their movie much better than Avengers 2. Yeah, that's true. I will give them that. They, 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 that character is having fun. That's the one thing in the whole X-Men series was lacking was fun. And like, he actually brings that humor and that fun to it. But the, on the other side is that they, you know, they introduced or what well, we kind of knew from the first movie that, um, you know, Magneto's his dad. And so that was kind of a weird, like, Oh, I'm not going to tell him just yet or whatever. It, it was kind of this weird conflict that they just added to the movie for no reason that I, I don't know. Why do you think they did that? I don't know. That was kind of weird for me, too, because, you know, they, they say it like two or three times that he's his dad, and then two times he has a chance to tell him, and he's like, no, I'm not going to tell him, and then at the end of the movie, he's like, I'm just going to stick around, and I'll eventually tell him, but basically, it's like everybody knows. It's like almost like three's coming. Right. Like, everybody knows that Jack Tripper's not gay, except for the Ropers. It's a, right, exactly, and, and, and then after, it, it really takes away from the fact that his wife and daughter died. Right. I just I didn't like I didn't like that at all. It just started taking away from that. But I think we can positively say that we probably are the only review that you will ever read or hear or see that made a correlation between Three's Company and X Men. <laughs> <laughs> so so Magneto's the is Jack Tripper. <laughs> no 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 Magneto's Magneto's uh, the Ropers. Mister Mister Roper. Right, and he thinks, and everybody knows that Quicksilver is his dad, except for Magneto. <laughs> it is kind of a bad sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> but what here's the thing too is like he says he's gonna stick around, and then like the next scene, Magneto's gone, and it's like, well, when the fuck did you plan on telling him? Because he's not coming. Where did back. he go? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then you know that you know that uh, Mystique, in, you know, ends up with him. Although that's kind of a weird relationship. I don't know if she's like infatuated by him or what i don't know i'm not sure about that one too i just talking about that end sequence when or scene where magneto leaves like i I did kind of geek out a little bit because mystique is in her like almost traditional like white dress but she's in this white armor which is fucking cool and everybody else was more traditional towards what they normally are in the comic books so i thought that was pretty cool what do you think of um what do you think of Oscar Isaac as Apocalypse? I, you know, why? Uh, that's a good looking dude. Why put all that makeup on him for? Like, well, I, mean, I don't that's understand. what Apocalypse looks like. You know, he looks like that in the comic books. So I get, I guess. Um, I don't know, man. Like, there were times where he was like under the hood. I thought he looked like the mummy. There were times where, or like just a like a dark Jedi or something like that. Um, you know, he's just like walking around through the courtyard and nobody's even giving him a second look, you know? Um, I don't know. Like even the way he was summoned and all that stuff, I didn't quite understand. It was a magic or something or, you know, um, I thought, I think Oscar Isaacs is awesome. Like in everything that I've seen him in, he's amazing. Um, but this movie, I don't know. I think it's a step back for for him. I think he needs to go back to more intimate roles and all that. And and uh, but I I don't even think like I don't know what to say because even the acting is subpar because the, the makeup and all that stuff just kind of took me out of it a little bit. I don't know. I, yeah, you know, I've seen. I mean, Apo- I don't the know. way the way that they wanted Apocalypse in this movie, and I mean. Basically, Apocalypse is whatever you put when you were reading the comic books. You put whatever voice you had in your head, something deep, something menacing. And then Mm -hmm. it isn't until the X-Men animated series that you actually had an idea of what you thought he was going to sound like. Um, 
and in this version of it, it was kind of um, close to what I pictured from the or from what I heard from the X Men animated series. Um, but it almost was like I don't want to say like a bad B movie villain voice, but it kind of borders on that a little bit. It wasn't very intimidating. It wasn't it wasn't comical, but it wasn't great. You know, and and again, no. we love we love Oscar Isaac. I think he's a great actor. Yeah, but I just I think that character. I don't I don't think they got it. You know what I mean? Like you know how when somebody cracks the code on a on a on a comic, like how Ryan Reynolds cracked the code on, on Deadpool. It's like that's the character yeah. that I always pictured. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. when I saw Apocalypse and heard him and saw like a, you know because because again Brian Singer had such a great track record with the X Men, I was like just let me wait till I see the movie. Right. I was surprised. I was surprised how bad the movie was tracking on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, but when I saw it and I, you know, gave Oscar Isaac a chance, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't think they got it. You know, he, he, well, like you, you, you've said it many times before. If the animated series is better than the movie, there's something wrong. You know, like yeah. you can kind of go back to, I mean, even think of the Clone Wars. OK, and we've talked about this. The Clone Wars. Uh, cartoon had General Grievous in it, and he was a badass motherfucker, like scary. He was killing Jedi left and right, and then as soon as like Mace Windu, uh, Mace Windu gave him that that chokehold, and he started coughing. Then when by the time we watch him in Episode Three, he's a little punk ass bitch. He was running away from fights. He wasn't menacing at all, like not scary at all. I yeah. just thought he was he was laughable, but in the cartoon, he scared the shit out of me. You know what I mean? And I, I think the same thing with Apocalypse. I think in the cartoon, they just really like, of course, the cartoon, I guess you can do a little more, you know, whatever. But still, I mean, if you're going to bring a cartoon into live action, you need to figure out a way to make him or her, or her you know, menacing. That They're the main villain. This is a lot of problems that they're having in a lot of these uh, Marvel movies, too, is the villains aren't as, or even in Batman v Superman, you know, Lex Luthor, they, the villains aren't up to par. Um, you know, I, I guess Civil War did it in a way where, you know, uh, Zemo was very much like a Lex Luthor, you know, but it was ultimately them fighting themselves. I mean, they were their own villains pretty much, but you had a guy very intelligent pull the strings. Apocalypse, you know, it, there was a couple times where he did something really freaky, like made a guy meld into the wall. I was like, oh shit, that's, that's pretty crazy. You know, I kind I kind of like that. But then be, that just became a one-trick pony. You just kept doing it over and over again. Um, and uh, I don't know. He just wasn't as menacing as you would want. And then in the trailer, you see him grow big and squish him and all that stuff. Well, that was in a dream sequence, or that was in his mind, right. in uh, what's-his-name's mind. So I was like, well, that's dumb. You know, so I don't know. You know, um, I, thinking about the movie now, like I, I had a really hard time. You know, we do what we always do when we go see a brand new movie. We stay away from each other off the, off the phone and don't talk. You know, we just say right. yes or no, and that's it. And, I, you know, anytime I come out of a movie like this, I'm like, I don't know if I like it or hate it. I, I can't tell. And yeah. I think I'm more disappointed than anything with this movie. And looking back on it now and thinking about what I saw today, um, it was almost like you could have pulled every single thing out of this movie re-edited the movie and it could have been any other x-men movie and here's pretty much and here's how and here's why i say that because we've already seen recruiting right we've already seen the x-men recruit for the school we've Mm -hmm. seen um professor x kind of lose it to um you know get shut down which would happen in x-men 2 um we've seen a mutant try to take over the world by galvanizing other mutants that's basically every single x-men movie except for except for first class um you've seen gene gray twice now discover the phoenix power you've seen um gene gray struggling with her powers um and you see the other students trying to learn all their powers we've seen all this before and all of that happened in this movie which is really and again, you know, Apocalypse rehashes the same thing that Professor X did in all the movies where he tries to unlock their abilities or tries to get them to 
control their abilities to the 10th degree. Like if you think back to X-Men first class, you know, professor, and it's, it's, it's so much called back to that. He actually pulls clips from first class and talks right. about it and puts it in this movie and Apocalypse does the same thing over and over again to the Four Horsemen. Every single person that he recruits, he tells them that he can make their powers more powerful. He right. doesn't need anything. Right. So, you know, thinking back on it now, it's like I've seen this movie. I've seen this movie before. Nothing, nothing's different about it, really. You noticed um, uh, they come out of the, the theater. They, they watched Empire Strikes Back. No, they, they came out of Return of the Jedi. Right. You remember that? They're walking out of there and they're like, oh, that wasn't as good as the second movie. And they're like, oh, the third movie's never that good or something like yeah. that. They were I thought that was a knocking... direct dig at Last Stand again. Total, totally a dig at Last Stand. So I started thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? This is this was supposed – this should have been Brian Singer's uh, Last Stand. Like Brett, if Brett Ratner didn't make Last Stand and Brian Singer stayed on the franchise, this would be the movie that he would have made but with the original cast. I think um, the reason why I didn't like this movie as much is because the the Days of Futures Past was such a departure from the. I mean, yeah, some of the the um, core th- things of the X Men movies are in that movie, but it, it's a departure as far as like the formula. They did all this other cool stuff, time travel, you know, all that stuff. You even get to see X Men die. I mean, all all kinds of shit happens, and, and it's such a wonderful really cool movie a lot of humor in it too and all that stuff so then this movie just feels like they went right back to you know this feels like brett ratner's last stand it's just kind of like ugh. it's just kind of there you know there's nothing nothing new to the table nothing i mean after days of futures past was like a holy shit movie this it's almost like they needed another year or something and came out with something a little bit better or even two movies yeah they could have done that i mean in light of Batman v Superman and and Civil War, the two biggest superhero movies on the planet in a long time. This movie just does it doesn't hold up to them at, at all. Yeah, I and guess so, instead of uh, instead of Singer leaving the Golden Gate Bridge in the middle of uh, in the middle of the bay, he just destroys Cairo. <laughs> Pretty much, exactly. Yeah, forget a bridge. Let's just destroy the whole. Actually, destroy every. It's a, you know what. <laughs> I saw the bridge um, again from New York that uh, is made famous from The Dark Knight Rises. Yes. Um, that that uh, tan bridge. I can't think of the bridge off the top of my head, and I'm from the East Coast too. But I saw that bridge again, and I'm like, what the fuck? It's, it, does Hollywood just fall in love with places and just keep wanting to fuck it up over and over again? <laughs> like last year or the year before it was like let's just destroy san francisco every fucking time let's just destroy san francisco and then that that bridge in new york has has been in i don't know how many movies has that bridge been fucked up in the dark knight rises it's been in i think it's been in batman v superman or man of steel it's mm-hmm. been uh it's been in x-men this one i'm missing another one that it's been in i've seen that bridge like four or five times oh it was. It, they didn't destroy it, but it was in Civil War. It was. Yeah. The, it was. Where, it was right before uh, Tony Stark went to go talk to Spider Man. They didn't destroy the bridge. Leave it to Marvel they, to be the only people that don't destroy the bridge. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, they use a lot of the same locales, but they use it over and over and over again. And I don't know. But um, also, I was just thinking. You know, sorry, but going back to the. You know, this was should have been Brian Singer's third movie. He revisits the. You know, the, the Phoenix Saga because he never got to do it. He never got to do it because, um, you know, Ratner took over and really screwed it up. So yeah. it's almost feels like he's like going back to that. Like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't but get it was to do so it. So now I'm going to do it now. It was, it was so really rushed. rushed, really rushed. Because the whole time that thing's happening, I'm like, well, how the fuck are they going to beat him? And I'm like, is he really going to go to the Phoenix Saga right here? Because, it, you know, Professor X is saying, help me, Gene. And like yeah. right when she walks through the door, I'm like, here it comes. And I'm like, am I going to see like the giant Phoenix fire wings or whatever? <laughs> and there it is. It's fucking right there on screen. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, in the comic books and see, so I think we've said this before too. And I know I've said this off, off, off the podcast is that I'm okay with you changing the stories and changing the timeline around as long as the story is good. So I was always okay with singer changing it. Right. I was always okay with, with, you know, 
Wolverine joining the X Men at the very beginning instead of like years mm-hmm. down the road, decades down the road, um, when the X Men are already kind of established, you know. So he he plays around with the timeline a lot, and um, here's the one time that he plays around with the timeline, and I'm not okay with it because in this mm-hmm. because he rewrote everything in Days of Futures Past. Jean Grey is just introduced for the first time in this timeline. And basically, she can't control her powers because they hint at it a few times that she can't control her powers. She's the right. she's the top freak in the she's the top freak in the freak school, you know. And um and all of a sudden, she can't control her powers and then she unlocks the Phoenix side, the right. Phoenix power. Right. And the Phoenix thing saga, the story of th- this great X-Men comic book storyline deals with like the universe and stuff like that. And they never touched upon it in, in any of the singer movies at all. None, zero, everything takes place on earth. Right. So I have no, if, if he gets another shot at another X-Men movie, which I'd be surprised if he does or not, I'm really curious to see how they're going to do it and try not to do it like Brett Ratner did because they never teased anything like close to what that storyline is. So he plays liberties with with the storylines, the timelines, and all that stuff. I am curious and scared as hell to see what he's going to do with his version of the Phoenix Saga. Well, it, it's going to involve Phoenix Sonic, and it's going to involve, you know, spoilers again if you you got to sit through the credits, but Mr. Sinister uh, from the Essex Company. So, like, Mr. Sinister is, like, another one of those crazy villain guys that's been around for a long time, and he's, like, you know, testing, do, does testing on mutants and stuff like that, you know, the Weapon X program and all that stuff. So um, I'm curious to see where they're going to go after this thing, but... I, I don't know, man. Like I just, I felt like, again, this was a, a, another one of those films where like we're rushing to get to s- this other thing. So we're not concentrating on a good story, you know, for this particular movie. Now I will say that over the, the course of the last few films, Magneto and professor X, both their character arcs, you know, they're each movie. They're different. They're, they're growing as a character or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but all the other characters are kind of just, I don't know, like, like you said, Jean Grey was rushed, you know, Scott Summers, boom, you're in there. Okay, go. You're the leader now, you know, um, th- they he killed shows half. zero yeah. leader quality, like leadership skills in this movie. None. Zero. It's yeah. Mystique leading them. Yeah, it's Mystique exactly. Leading them. Because she's the highest paid actress. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Um, um, you know, and, and before she was like, she didn't want to do any, she didn't want to do right. any more movies. Now all of a sudden she wants to do all of them, but probably not after this rating and, and, you know, these reviews coming out, but I no, will show sure, the money. I, I, I completely agree with you that, I mean, I love Patrick Stewart, love Ian McKellen, but I like these versions. I think a lot better. Yeah, I do like, too. Uh, uh, how do you say his name? Michael Fosp- uh, Fosbender. Yeah. And James they're McAvoy. Just, they're they're so both conflicted good. people. Yeah, they're both very conflicted. You know, they both they both have, you know, you understand where both are coming from. You know, again, it's just good writing. You know, you understand. Like, poor, like, Magneto has had a shit life. Yeah. His par- parents being killed, him taken away from his, you know, parents and being tortured and, you know, awful shit i mean x-men first class really tells you a lot about him Mm -hmm. and then and then you know after the last movie days of futures past he was able to finally like okay i don't have to be bad i don't have to be evil i can i can live amongst these people i'll leave them the fuck alone if they leave me alone and he starts building this life and then he gets it ripped away from him again of course he's pissed off at humanity you know um, and the same with, the, with Professor Xavier. I mean, he's had this like charm life and then, you know, all of a sudden he lose, you know, he gets his uh, spine severed and, you know, and, and his, he's fighting with his best friend. I mean, it was all these conflicts. And I, you're right. I, I like these versions better, too. I really like uh, their story arcs are great. Um, it really I think drives this is, the I think drives this the movie movies. is like a case of Amazing Spider-Man 2 in the sense that the that the lead actors in the movie kind of carry the film. And, and That's this movie, pull. this movie is not as bad as Amazing Spider-Man Two, um, right? But um, 
but in the same aspect of the characters, or I'm sorry, the actors carrying the movie. Um, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. That's 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 I mean, a really if good. You put any, if you put anybody else in here, like I think if you put like James Morrison in here in this movie, he's 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 an okay actor. Um, mm-hmm. But you make him the main character, and you don't have James McAvoy. Um, you know, you, you, and I don't even know who like Oscar. We love Oscar Isaac. I don't know if you put anybody else as Apocalypse, they could have saved Apocalypse's character. No, no. You know, I don't um, think so either. Jennifer Lawrence is Jennifer Lawrence. She's she's good and she's good in whatever she does. So there's no complaints yeah. there. Evan Peters, you know, he's he's Quicksilver. Their version of Quicksilver. I, I like what they do with him. Like you said, Olivia Munn's kind of wasted. Um, Nicholas Holt is. He's just the same. I think he's the same person as he was in the first one that he was. Yeah, in. he doesn't change at all. Yeah, he doesn't um, change at all. What do you think of uh, Storm? We didn't really talk about Storm. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of liked her. I don't know what she was doing in Cairo. Is that where she was in Cairo? I can't remember, but she, she, I think in the, I think in, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm almost, I'm pretty sure that it, she was a thief. Um, that's actually how. I think that's how she meets Gambit actually. Um, okay. In the comics, but she, she was a thief and professor X finds her. And I think pulls her into the X-Men. I, I think the only problem I had with her and it really wasn't her as a character is she just seems so out of place in that country. I didn't, I'm like, what are you doing there? You know, but um, other than that, I, I thought she was great. I liked her accent. I liked her look. <laughs> yeah. You know, she, uh, um, she definitely has a better accent than Hall- Oscar winner Halle Berry does. <laughs> from x-men one when she tried it yeah <laughs> it was so the bad next movie, they fucking they was like no 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 don't do the voice right thing. don't do the accent you just be you you're you're no longer from africa you're from fucking brooklyn you're halle berry yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't, don't do an african accent just do a halle berry accent yeah, exactly so just in that sense pretty. yeah so in that sense she was um she was kind of believable um not as good as not as good as uh the guy who was black panther's accent that guy's oh, accent Lord. was dead, like was spot that on. That dude. That talk about Marvel taking a, a pretty like unknown actor and making him like everyone cannot wait for that movie, Black Panther. Nobody can wait. Yeah. So excited. Oh, you um, know what? We didn't talk about we didn't talk about Hugh Jackman. What'd you think of him being in this movie? Okay, well, I'm okay. I'm pissed off that they hinted. They didn't need to do that. Why they did that as a stunt to get people to go to see the movie. Um, pissed me off. If I would have, if I would have sat in that f- theater and, and saw Alkaline Lake and I would have got goosebumps. And then, and then when he was revealed, I would have been like, ah, oh, that would have been my shit moment. Holy shit moment. But they took it away because I knew it was coming. As soon as I saw Alkaline Lake, I'm like, oh yeah, this is where Hugh Jackman pops in. There was no surprise whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of cool. You know, they did the whole like almost like rancor scene from return of the Jedi. Cause like the thing that opens up and you're like, Oh, here comes the rancor. So like Hugh Jackman comes out and finally we get to actually see what berserker mode is supposed to be like blood and guts and just cutting people up and all that shit. So that was pretty cool. But, and then he was like, had that contraption on him or something like that. Like, that I don't know. Like me, I under- that took me completely. I mean, that was right out of the comic books. Right. So they do the, yes, they do the foot to the, to the head moment. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, he doesn't have any, doesn't have shoes on. I'm like, okay, holy shit, are they gonna do the what the next thing? There's that famous mm-hmm. comic book cover, where or, or or panel where you know he's in like basically like underwear, and mm-hmm. he's got this shit coming out of his chest, and then he's got this like visor thing on his head, All right? Because basically, if I can remember correctly from the comics, it's it's um, that's how they're trying to control him, basically, yes. you know, giving him direction and stuff like that. But then they got, to, I was like, oh my God, they're going to fucking do it. And I was expecting to see this like visor, just like in the comic books, right? But instead, it looks like they glued like two remote controls and stuck it to the side of his head. <laughs> yeah, pretty and much. <laughs> it completely <laughs> took me out of it. Like every time he was killing somebody and like going like fucking berserker Wolverine rage, I'm like, somebody take the fucking direct TV remotes off his head. Like, <laughs> he looked fuck. like the he looked like the one of the the ghosts from Thirteen Ghosts, you know, with that contraption on its head, the cage the, on its no, head. No, Wolverine's was worse, but looked it worse. Was, <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking worse. I'm like, you're a secret government facility. What the what what is that thing on his head? Like, it looks like. Uh, oh, do you remember that toy, like Spy Tech? 
Yes. Yeah, that's what it looked like. <laughs> yeah, that's what it looked like. It's from Toys R Us. Fucking, yeah. Fucking use the, the secret government facility uses spy tech to control Wolverine. No wonder <laughs> fucking Weapon X failed. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so I don't know. Like it was, it was kind of cool, but I think it would have been cooler if they didn't tease it, because they never said like when they were filming that movie, there was yeah, no were mention. Very, well, yeah, there they was were no mention. They're, yeah, they were adamant. It's like you, you spent all that time like not telling us. Why the fuck would you tell us before? <laughs> I don't know. It's so stupid. Uh, I mean, you know who does, Force Awakens does it right. <laughs> Like, why well, would you like would, that would be like that would be like the way that the force awakens has done it like well we don't know who Ray's parents are we don't know who Ray's parents are and then like a week before episode eight comes out it's like Ray's parents is luke skywalker you know it's they like tell you just the, fucking the tell you right the, 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 the very beginning of the trailer says just she goes hi dad <laughs> yeah exactly it's like dad can you give me a glass of blue milk before i go to sleep i walked all these stairs i'm fucking tired like i need <laughs> yeah. something to drink yeah um yeah Don't you was, have an escalator shit <laughs> because they were because they were so adamant about him not being in the movie i was like okay cool finally a, a fucking x-men movie that doesn't have wolverine in it you know right like, i mean even deadpool had wolverine in it in some fashion you know what i mean like yeah. so finally i was like okay cool an x-men movie no wolverine great i'm okay with it um but then you know they showed in the trail i'm like well what the fuck I thought I was going to get an X Men movie about it. They did that. They did that for one and only, one reason only, and that's to get people in the seats. Because if you don't have Wolverine in there for whatever reason, they think they can't put him in the seats. Did you? And did like you, you also think this too? Where, um, where they kind of recreate the scene from X Men One, where Jean Grey, who's a much older Jean Grey in X Men One, is you know doing this whole thing with the side of you know Logan's head mm-hmm. and trying to unlock his past or whatever, and as she's doing it, I'm like, wait, he's supposed to have the hots for her. She's like supposed to be like, what, 18, 16? And he's like 75. I felt really, that was really awkward. Yeah. I, that, that moment, too. I, I turned to um, my fiance and I was just like, um, you remember like in X Men 1 and 2, they were trying to get it on. <laughs> like, this is kind of weird. Like, she's way young. Yeah, Jean Grey, <laughs> Jean Grey ages really fast. <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> I mean, even, even um, you know, even the actress who plays uh, uh, Jean Grey and, and Sansa, Sophia Turner, she uh, she looks young. You know what I mean? Like, she's, yeah, she she's does. tall or whatever, but she has this very young face. And when you put it up against, like, a, a, a scraggly-looking Wolverine, it's like... <laughs> Vagrant Dude, Wolverine, Wolverine. Yeah, Wolverine's a fucking pervert. Like, fuck Wolverine. <laughs> like, like your your actual age is probably like eighty five. You know, in the in the oh, movie, yeah. but yeah. you look like you're forty. You know, you look like you're fucking forty. Stop looking at the sixteen year old like you want to fuck her. That's wrong. <laughs> Go back in the cage. Well, it's almost yeah. like yeah, it's almost like in episode one where you know you get Natalie Portman and you get Jake Lloyd and you're like, uh, something not right here at all right right exactly it even felt awkward in the second movie too really like he was just like awkward and she should have known better (laughs) yeah just like shit (laughs) um but yeah um i don't know man like i i think that there's just there would have been a lot of good potential this movie I, i felt like they rushed this movie um off the heels of days of futures past which was amazing they really rushed this thing. Um, now, the way it ends, so after the end credits, you know, you see uh, the Essex company. Well, you right. see it on a briefcase or something like that, right? Um, yes. So you think, okay, that's, uh, that's Mr. Sinister. Okay, here's, here's the problem. Most people have no freaking clue who that is. So the end sequence has no impact whatsoever on people wait till they look them up wait till they look them up and they get the picture oh yeah he's weird looking yeah you thought apocalypse was weird looking just wait till you see what mr sinister looks like they're not going to make him look like that there's no way i mean he looks like like a cross between like the rock and like a vampire and like colossus or something yeah yeah, exactly yeah yeah all those three things together and and that's what mr sinister looks like and he's and he's responsible for like fathering cable 
and uh, uh, I think fathering Cable, um, or being responsible for he Cable. does he does something with uh, he basically I think I think he kidnaps Jean Grey at their wedding. Okay. In the comic books, I think I can't remember. It's been a while because Mister Sinister hasn't really done too. There's a lot of different stories. Line. He's got a. He's got several storylines but but at any rate at the end i mean everyone in the theater was just puzzled who's that i don't understand what's going on you know like most movies especially the marvel movies they do a really good job of like leaving you with like a holy shit at the end you know or something um this didn't was not a holy shit moment this was a what is i don't understand what's going on here like yeah, me, they did a I'm better job the they should have yeah. they should have did that with wolverine and like not shown anything because like right. at least even with yeah. Thanos, like if you weren't a comic book fan, you got to see what that guy looked like, and you're like, who the fuck is that? But all you saw right. in this one was a was a briefcase, right? You saw a briefcase, and then you mm-hmm. saw vials, and that's it. Because before I saw the plaque on the on the uh, on the brief, and <laughs> here's the other thing: if you're if okay, so they're already going to a secret underground facility, right? Already mm-hmm. a secret government facility. So I'm guessing since they're they have full access to that, that they're like double secret, you know, government people or whatever, right? Right, right. Why would you put your fucking name of your company on the briefcase? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously they're not that secret or they don't really care that much about it. It's like it's like I'm, in um it's like in like a Looney Tunes cartoon where you know it's poison because it's got the fucking like you know, the skull and the X on it, not the fact that it's green and it's like fucking spewing out like fumes and shit. Like it, ha- you have to <laughs> overplay it. Like if you're a secret government facility that is going into a secret government facility and you don't need their permission to, that means you're higher up than them or whatever. And you put your right. name on the fucking briefcase. Like the fuck. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, cause if you think about, really if you think, think about that, that end really scene, that. you think about that end scene in, um, what was that? Uh, was it? Uh, it was it Thor, or was mm-hmm. it Captain America, where they have the briefcase with the the tesseract? The, the, yeah, the tesseract in it. You didn't see fucking the big giant shield insignia. I don't think on that silver briefcase, right? <laughs> it was just a silver <laughs> what briefcase. If the, what if the briefcase was clear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you might as well make it clear and say secret secret government shit inside. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, yeah, that, I didn't think about that. That's kind of stupid. I mean, obviously, that was for the audience to go, oh, Miss, that's Mr. Sinister, you know, which most of the audience had no fucking clue who that was <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or what the Essex company was. They're like, ah. What, yeah, so. they were better off just showing Mr. Sinister in some form. I waited uh, 10 minutes of credits just for that. I had to piss so yeah. bad just to fucking see a plaque on a briefcase. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> You're I'm like so I'm gonna mad. piss on the floor. I'm so I'm mad. so fucking mad. <laughs> it's like I stay away from spoilers, and I was like, okay, what's gonna set up the next movie? And then they show it. I'm like, fuck, a briefcase. I waited fucking ten minutes for a briefcase. <laughs> so there is. They have said there is gonna be another movie, and it'll be set in the '90s. So it seems like each movie is ten years increments, um, which is kind of strange to me because they can't they can't age those the actors are the right age now where they should be so like now you're gonna make jennifer lawrence like you know 50 you're gonna right. make you're gonna make you know magneto in his late 50s or early 60s well or hopefully hopefully in 10 fucking years they learn how to use their fucking powers <laughs> i don't know how they're gonna make sansa like you know older but whatever i i don't know get bring back time travel do some cool shit with that again because that was fun i don't know i'm just i'm just really it's just really meh i mean obviously it was kind of refreshing not to have um the good guys fight each other so i mean like the other two movies but (laughs) yeah but at the same time we've seen this movie before you know still with parents what's with the parents like the other two movies is like oh your name is martha My, my mom's name is martha and this one it's like quicksilver's like you know running around going like oh that's my dad but i'm not sure i should tell him i'm just I'll like just tell everybody kidding? else i'll just tell everybody else <laughs> i'll just tell everybody else exactly um that just that didn't make any sense whatever they're trying you know bring in drama where it really how about how about it's almost game. like uh everybody knows that ross loves rachel but rachel was the only one that didn't know right forever 
Yeah. How about know. that? How about that? Another. No. I don't think you'll. See, I don't think you'll hear, read, or see another review that made a Friends and X Men reference. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and then another thing we didn't really touch upon, but Rose Byrne's character comes back, the CIA agent, yeah. and has she... one of the funniest moments at the end for me. But what were you gonna say? Well, I was going to say he like he, he decides, I mean, he told everybody like oh, I erased her memory. He must have said it three times. And then at the end, he like, you know, puts his hand on her and says, remember everything and then kisses her and, you know, whatever. So, you know, like that's not going to end well. You're like, oh, shit, she's going to die in the next movie, you know, because they're they're alone. These people aren't meant to be with anybody, you know. Uh, that was Xavier comical to me. Magneto. That was that was that was funny to me as as much as like the TV remote controls plastered on Wolverine's head. Like that was oh my fucking God. funny to me because there was there was a there was a specific purpose of why he did it in first class. Right. And like just to get like an emotional pull from you, he like you know goes back and says, "No, no, we're going to undo that." But you and un- you undo it now. Like there's no reason there's no it. reason he does the opposite of what Superman does to Lois Lane at the end of Superman two. You know? <laughs> yeah. He does the absolute opposite thing. I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, actually what you he know? does, what he does actually is what he does, what Superman does to Lois Lane in quest for peace. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. That's right. <laughs> He's like, Hey, I'm, Hey, uh, Lois, come walk with me. Oh, but before <laughs> before I fucking, like, make you remember, I'm going to give you the biggest fucking heart attack scare ever by, throw, like, like, like walking you off this building. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, give you, like, the best sex of your life. Oh, no, no. Then I'll, t- then like, I'll tell like you could have, Superman. Like, Lois was, like, you know, because in that version, Lois is smoking and doing all this shit. Like, she could have fucking yeah. had a heart attack there because he could have just kissed her. And like said, okay, remember. But instead, he fucking like holds her hand and walks her off the fucking building and just let her fall. And like she could have just like he could have she could have just died from a heart attack. Like she could have just right. had a major stroke right there. So, oh no, he's got to be a pimp. He's got to do a pimp move. You know, yeah. be be all cool and shit. Yeah. And is, then, it, is, it, I don't know. is it is it is it me? But when you go back and watch those movies, you know, Chris Reeve is a good looking guy and Margot Kidder is not very good looking. So I, I don't know what he saw in her that, that that dude could get whoever he wanted instead. Instead, he wanted a, a chain smoking, you know, kind of person a weird chick. Spell. A chain smoking person <laughs> who needed hooked on phonics. Right. <laughs> That's right. She couldn't spell. <laughs> and she ordered him around like is her little bitch. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> not but, to mention uh, anyway. that in, not to mention in that movie that he was it was like he was the only one that was like the same height as superman in that movie nobody else was that tall right but he, if you go but back he and watch it, that movie if you go back and watch yeah. that movie there's nobody as tall as as christopher reeve in that movie and he stands out like a sore thumb he does but but he also like he does this thing with his body where he 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 puts his shoulders forward and he kind of hunches a little bit yeah, I you know, know he does. But still. He does this characterization. I know any moron would figure it out, but at least he did a better job than like Henry Cavill. Just looks, he looks like Superman all the time. All yeah, the he time. looks like Superman rolled out of bed. Right. <laughs> That's his Clark Kent. When he's got a hat on, when he's got a parka on, they're like, "That's Superman." Yeah, it's it, he. It's exactly the same all the time. I don't know, but whatever. Anyway, um, so let's say let's let's give it a rating. If you had if it's out of five stars, what would you give? What would you give this? Movie? Uh, I would give it uh, personally. I'd give it a two and a half. Two and a half. I think it's fifty percent Rotten Tomatoes. If I was working for Rotten Tomatoes, yeah. I'd say fifty percent. I'd say it's around fifty for me too. Um, I think the only thing that saves this movie is the stellar cast. Like this is a really good young cast. It is a good um, cast. even the newcomers. Even the newcomers that they got, very talented young cast, and I think. You know, in, in this case, um, Singer kind of just fell short in the cast, as good as they are. You know, he's a good director, you know, and, and maybe the story was just too big to condense into one movie. I'm kind of thinking um, it is. They needed more time. They needed more yeah. time. I mean, I, I, I don't, personally, I don't believe that it's worse than, than The Last Stand that Rotten Tomatoes is showing mm-hmm. at all. I don't think it's worse than Last Stand. Last Stand is fucking horrible on the same level as uh, <laughs> X-Men Origins. Yeah, it's it's down there. It's down there in the ratings, that's for sure. But 
yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so that's another top ten off of our uh, off of our summer block. Yeah, that's your number six. Yeah, it's outside of my top ten. It's gonna stay there. Uh, but uh, for you, I guess we'll have to wait and see by the end of the year where you would place this. You know, in your top ten. It'd so, probably be out of my top ten, or if it is even in the top ten, yeah. I mean, there's no way that Zootopia would not be in my top three right now. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. But yeah, uh, all right. Anyway, well, that was uh, you know X Men Apocalypse. Uh, go see it. You know, buyer beware. Um, you've heard our. I'm sure you've already seen it. Otherwise, why would you listen to this? But if you haven't seen it, you know that's that's up to you. But uh, it wasn't as strong as effort. But uh, yeah, that was uh, episode 27 of Chew on This, a Nerds United podcast. I'm BJ. Chew on that, folks. Till next time. Later.